Hi, my name is Nabila, and thank you for joining us at the FAIR Virtual Summit Roundtable. We're here today to talk about The End of Food Allergies, a book authored by Dr. Kari Naidu and Sloan Barnett. Dr. Naidu is the director of the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University, and Sloan Barnett is a lawyer, journalist, author, and a food allergy mom. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here. I wanted to start by talking a little bit about your book. The End of Food Allergy takes a look at the food allergy epidemic, the great depth um, that you pull from, his, from history about how it came about, as well as diving into the latest research. Why did you decide to write this book in particular, and why now? First, because we really want to make sure that we provide a book for educating the public and for educating on the global level. We're so excited about that. Second, because this is the first year that there has been a product approved by the FDA for the use in food allergy. That is super exciting. This is a huge flexion point in history. And it represents the work of so many researchers and hardworking physicians to be able to get to this point. So it's also a celebration of a lot of work in science. And then thirdly, we really wanted to have people understand that there are some hoaxes out there. There are some myths out there. There are some people that have promoted some items that might not necessarily be true. And that based on science, we have a whole section in the book on myth busters and what's true and what's not true, what's available now, what's not available now. We also talk about food allergies versus food sensitivities because that's on a lot of people's minds. And we not only talk about therapy, but we also talk about prevention and diagnosis and how to make sure that we can get ahead of this disease. So we tried to make it a book for everyone not only people with food allergies, but also people without food allergies. So we really are excited to be here today and talk about the book and what it means. Fantastic. Dr. Naidu, what has changed in the food allergy space that you want people to know about? I'm really excited that based on a lot of research, there's been a lot of changes over even the past five years. Since Sloan and I have gotten to know each other and when her children went through the immunotherapy years ago, they were the pioneers. And so what we've learned from that is we've learned that the dosing for immunotherapy can be lower and slower and not necessarily causing a lot of reactions while they're undergoing therapy. We've also learned a lot about the mindset of the patients and Sloan will talk about that more with families and how they're struggling and their perspective on therapy. And that's been really helpful, and that's part of the book as well. We've also learned about prevention. Everyone asks, what's causing this epidemic? Why is it doubling every 10 years? What are the interactions between gene and environment? And so we've learned a lot about ways to potentially decrease the risk of food allergy, and that's in the book as well. So we're really excited about the knowledge gained by many people around the world, and FAIR has been critical to that research. Without FAIR, we wouldn't have been able to of the gain and the progress that we were able to talk about in the book. And I'll let Sloan talk more about what we've learned so far. It's been incredible. Um, it's true. My kids were there in the beginning. Um, there, there were some before, but um, we were there early days. And I, I use that word pioneer because I feel like so proud of them that they had the bravery, although I'm not sure they had a choice. We got to meet Kari, um, you know, over 10 years ago, uh, just got lucky to meet a couple at a wedding who introduced us to this fabulous doctor at Stanford. And I took two of my children, one of whom is allergic to peanuts and one to all the tree nuts. Um, life was hard for us back then. You know, avoiding nuts is one thing, but it's not so easy to do when you travel and you want to eat out in restaurants, when you're sending kids off to a lunchroom. I know all the moms out there, they understand because they all are experiencing the exact same thing. It ain't easy. And um, cross-contamination is out there. Mistakes are everywhere. And so maybe you can protect your kids in your little cocoon, but the minute you allow them out into the world, it becomes very challenging. Stanford gave us the hope to think that there would be a solution. 
Um, and I think for me, the book is really about hope. Um, we called it the end of food allergy on purpose. That's the promise that we can really think about today. Um, it's not over for any of us, but we are on such a great path, as Kari pointed out. Things are changing so quickly, and it's extraordinary to watch the science actually evolve in front of our very own eyes. From the days when my kids started in OIT to today, my kids are headed off to college, and they are safe, um, and they don't carry EpiPens, and they go to parties, not during COVID, um, and they are able to be out in the world without the same fear and panic that we once lived with every day, and that I know so many moms listening today understand. Yeah, thank you for that, Sloan. I know it can be really, really tough um, as a mom, uh, especially, so we really appreciate you bringing that perspective. You mentioned oral immunotherapy or, or OIT, and there are a lot of people in the food allergy community who are familiar with that term. But for those who aren't, can you explain what uh, oral immunotherapy is? Sure. Oral immunotherapy started actually back in the 1900s, and it was actually first published in England. So a person started as a doctor to try to treat his patient with egg allergy. And they started with a very small amount of egg and they built it up very carefully over time so that at the time that the patient was done, they were at an increased threshold of what they could normally tolerate for egg. And so that process was called desensitization. And it's like building immune muscles. So you start low and slow and then you build ever so slightly in a safe way so that people basically get used to that food allergen and it has to be every day. It can't be every week. It can't be every month. There's something to that daily process of building your immune strength so that you can overcome that allergy. And that's the process of desensitization. There are a lot of cells involved. There are a lot of different molecules in our body that are involved in protecting us. And we need to find markers to predict when someone is cured or not. But importantly, that's the process. And during the process, someone can have some reactions along the way because you're giving them back the food allergen that they were originally allergic to. But in that, it needs a trained personnel team. You need trained people in a safe facility to be giving this immunotherapy. And we wanna make sure that it's available to everyone. And so an FDA approved drug is really important to be able to pave the way towards not just peanut, but also giving oral immunotherapy for all food allergies. Some of the first food allergies that were done in desensitization were milk and egg. And those types of food allergies are still around in our society. And we need to make sure that we treat people carefully as well as to their exact food allergen, because you can't treat peanut allergy with milk, for example, it has to be specific. And there are a lot of companies now that are involved in helping out with oral immunotherapy. I'm so excited that we have the FDA approval now and hopefully now European approval. But importantly, it's the start, like Sloan said, of a pathway. And oral immunotherapy represents one of those choices. There's others as well, like epicutaneous immunotherapy, sublingual immunotherapy, immunotherapy with monoclonal antibodies. And so I think what's great, and I hope that the people at the summit will also be very happy to embrace this hope and promise that science is delivering some very exciting new regimens, including oral immunotherapy, that will help out many families and patients. Sloan, can you talk a little bit about how oral immunotherapy can change the quality of people's life? I know that your daughter, Violet, um, underwent oral immunotherapy and she's out living her best life. Uh, would love to hear a little bit more about that from your perspective as a mom and uh, how that's impacted Violet. Um, great question. Um, I always like to say that it's hard. Um, I, I don't want to tell you that we didn't live through a, a, a lot of complex difficulty, sitting in the hospital, driving, getting there every single week. Um, my daughter took part in a clinical trial and she had to eat foods. This is the really interesting part to understand for those who have not read the book yet. And you, you'll read her story in the book. She had to eat foods that she was told her whole life could harm her or even kill her. 
And so that's quite a interesting thing for a young child and a mom, by the way, watching it happen. We, of course, trusted the incredible staff at Stanford, Kari's um, amazing team who watch the entire time as the updosing is happening. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize it's not easy. And it has to be done in front of a, a, a highly competent team. And Kari alluded to that, and I'll just repeat that again. Um, we happen to be in a hospital setting. The promise of tomorrow is that you could be in a doctor's office, but you certainly don't want to listen to this um, video presentation or read our book and go to your kitchen and start to stock peanuts and give them to your kids haphazardly. Um, that's not what this is about. This is a very um, scientific-based, very rigorous program. And so we went through it and we survived. And still, it was difficult. Violet had to continue to eat the tree nuts in our home. Um, we, we sometimes snicker about the fact that we were running a tree nut factory in our pantry because there were buckets of all the different kinds of pre, you know, pecan and walnut, and we had them all going on. Um, and it was hard for her. And the children who go through this, most of them will tell you, you know, at the beginning, my uh, Kari asked my son, what would he want to eat if he were successful at this? And he said, oh, I, I dream of eating a Reese's peanut butter cup. But when it came time to actually that he could eat the Reese's, which thanks to Kari and OIT, he was able to eat an entire package of Reese's. He didn't, didn't really want to. He was scared to do it. But the promise, as you say, and the, and the hope and the wonderful thing is that my kids are now off to college, um, both of them, and they can go to restaurants and be at a party and be in the normal course of life and not live frightened and not live scared. And um, they still ask questions and they still want to know what foods are in what, and they still ask the waiters questions, but they don't have to live in entirely panicked um, about what could possibly happen. And, you know, I, I laugh, but it's not a crazy example to think they don't have to ask a boy or a girl, you know, what they've consumed before they get that first kiss. Um, they are teenagers after all. And these are things that food allergy kids think about. Um, so imagine the comfort of a parent, of a mom who can allow their kids out into the world. And that ranges from like the lunchroom in middle school all the way to going to fancy college across the country in our case. Um, and feel good about the fact that Thanks to Stanford, thanks to Kari Nadeau, thanks to OIT, which we describe in the end of food allergy, there's hope for all these kids. And um, it's, a, it's a great new day. Thank you to science. Speaking of hope and to switch gears a little bit here, uh, going from oral immunotherapy to early introduction, I know you talk about that in the book as well. What role does early introduction have uh, in the prevention of food allergies for those people who you know are either looking to prevent it in all their children or perhaps that they've had one child with a food allergy already and are really looking to prevent it in their subsequent children it's an excellent question yes it has a big role so prevention of foods not only peanut plays a critical role in educating the immune system and the gut so that people can decrease their risk of getting food allergy. And since food allergy is so high in terms of prevalence in the world, one in 12.5 children in the US, many millions of people throughout the world, 8% of children in China now have a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy. This is not going away. And we want to talk about therapy and delivering on the promise of therapy, but we also need to get ahead of the disease in terms of prevention. And so with that, we've learned a lot over the past five years. And it's difficult because some well-meaning people designed guidelines back in 2000, not that long ago, just about 20 years ago, to say, avoid foods for infants. Don't give them egg or milk or peanut. And in fact, unfortunately, that was not based on a lot of evidence on strong facts. And now fast forward 20 years, and now we have many studies, thanks to Gideon Lack, who we talk about in the book, thanks to FAIR, who sponsored a lot of these studies for prevention, as well as the National Institutes of Health. And now with that strong evidence, we can now say, instead, we actually need to diversify the diet. At around four to six months of age, you can start with breastfeeding, and giving small amounts of diverse foods. And we know that it helps prevent food allergy. And that's really exciting that we're taking the knowledge from Europe, from Asia, from the United Kingdom, 
from studies done here in the US now and to say definitively diversifying the diet is helpful and it's safe. Many mothers who've already had children with food allergies ask me, how are we gonna make sure this doesn't cause a food allergy by diversifying the diet? Because it is confusing, but we now know that it's safe. It's also safe to diversify your diet while you're pregnant and while you're breastfeeding. So there's no reason to believe that this would be anything counter to what our grandmothers taught us or what their grandmothers taught us to diversify the diet is easy and to do it regularly and often is the best way to prevent food allergy. Yeah, one of the things that I found really fascinating is in the book was your historical look back at how perhaps we used to be eating and how some of the things that we've learned over time are actually really applicable now and the science is truly catching up. One of the things looking a little future forward I found absolutely fascinating was the role of the gut and the skin. So can you talk a little bit about how these, uh, these systems are interrelated when it comes to food allergies? Absolutely, and you know, in fact, I had this idea initially after Sloan and I had met, I had read her book already. Uh, and so it was really exciting for me to resonate with Sloan in writing this book about how much the environment plays a role in allergies and not just food allergies, but also allergies and asthma. And so when we wrote the book, both Sloan and I really wanted to make sure that we focused on things that affect the skin and the environment, things that affect our gut and our environment. And so what our mantra is at the current time, because there's a lot of data to show that this is perhaps true for the majority of individuals, is that through the skin, allergies begin, and through the diet, allergies can stay quiet. And that's actually was coined by the CEO of the company, Ashley Domkowski, who um, does work in the prevention with the four brands and then therapy with Aladap. But importantly is that when the skin barrier gets disrupted, that can then be an avenue by which allergens get through the skin and activate the allergic pathway. And you think, why would the skin do that? Well, first, it's a barrier. It's this natural barrier to the outside world. And in the old days, when we were trying to combat parasites and mosquitoes and snake bites, the first thing our skin would do is to make sure that to occlude those things from breaking in the skin, it would swell up and get itchy so that we could itch off that mosquito and get rid of that snake if we knew that it bit us or get rid of that parasite if it was going through our skin. And it would also secrete mucus and liquid and skin lines our skin, but it also lines our lungs and our gut tract. So we have this automatic, what we would now call allergic response, but it was originally meant for foreign agents. And unfortunately now our bodies have been skewed. And when we see a danger signal like a food allergen, we create that same response as if it was the old days to a parasite. And to our bodies, it's actually dangerous. Now, anaphylaxis that's near fatal doesn't occur very often, but it can, and we worry about it. So through the skin, allergies can begin because if those allergens get through the skin, get taken up by our immune system, our immune system can have this misfiring of signals for some people that develop an allergy to that food. And if they get it enough of times, it doesn't have to be a lot, but if that little dust through the air that Helen Broff um, showed in her work in the United Kingdom, if it gets through the air into the skin in children with eczema and skin that already has disruption in it, it can be a problem for food allergy. But the good news is that our gut was actually meant to tolerate. Our gut is super smart. Our immune system lines our gut. And that as babies, as adults, as children, we eat foods and our gut says, oh, okay, that's normal. We're supposed to have that, that's nutritious. And luckily, if you look at how the gut is kind of wired, very different from the skin, when the gut sees foods, it says, all right, let's tolerate to that. So a baby with eczema, who could perhaps be getting this allergic signaling, getting this fired, if they're eating the foods at the same time, they will actually tolerate. The gut will overcome the skin issue. 
And that's what we explain in the book. And that's really important. Start early. In addition, protect the skin. Use the right emollients. So you can do all of these things at the same time, and that will change our behavior for how we can prevent disease. So we give all of these suggestions for parents and for people without food allergies in the book so we can start early and try to prevent the disease. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating how interconnected everything is. And that was a fabulous explanation. Dr. Naidu, it really does appear that no two people have the same exact food allergy in terms of the trigger and the reactions. And the complexity of what you just described could be one of the reasons for that. But I imagine that also has to be one of the biggest barriers to your research. No two people are the same. So what do you do and what can we do to mitigate that? Well, I think FAIR is doing an incredible amount with understanding differences and personalization of medicine. You know, in other fields, they've been really trying to understand things at the molecular level so that one size doesn't fit all. And we know that as parents, our children are different. You heard from Sloan, one of her children has a peanut allergy, the other has multiple food allergies. And they're brother and sister, but we've also looked at identical twins. And we have identical twins with the same exact genetics they have different food allergies or one will have a food allergy and the other one does not so like you said people are different and we respect that we admire that it's wonderful and to include everyone in access to immunotherapy and prevention is what we're all about but in doing that we also need to understand different people's response rates and different people's ability to prevent disease and when we're learning that it really makes a big difference to understand biomarkers, to understand genetics, to understand how can we look at plasma and blood cells quickly in small amounts that could be done at your home, to be able to diagnose the disease, to understand the differences from you or your sibling. How can we be get, get better at diagnosing? And with that diagnosis, FAIR has been working very hard with the community to try to take away the need for doing food challenges because food challenges also don't fit all. Lots of people respond differently to food challenges. And so I know that FAIR is working very hard to look at biomarkers that could replace food challenges, look at markers that define each individual to create the right therapy for them that might not necessarily even be the right therapy for their identical twin, because that's how different people can be. Yeah, and that's why it's so important that everybody shares their food allergy journey if they're willing to. And I know that the FAIR patient registry really helps um, make sure that there's lots yes. of diversity amongst uh, the people who can be researched. So if anybody's looking to get involved, you can join that way. Sloan, you know, there are so many challenges, you know, as a parent uh, for a child who has food allergies. Can you talk a little bit about just even emotionally how things have changed since Violet has undergone oral immunotherapy. What's, what's changed for your entire fi uh, family dynamic and for you? Um, food was frightening before. And, you know, I don't know about you all. Kari works too hard to worry about what she's going to have for dinner, but I care deeply about what I'm going to have for dinner. And food's a really big piece of the world in my household. I have three children. Um, and they're all completely different. Of course, they all like to eat different things, but food's a big piece of it. Sitting down to dinner, going out to restaurants in the old days, um, before the new normal is a very big part of our social life and our family dynamic. And the fact that we used to have to go and grill the waiter and, um, and, and, you know, I feel like I'm speaking to my compadres because I'm talking to the fair community and I know that parents who are listening can so understand because they're either have done it in the past or doing it currently to, to have to grill the waiter about what's in it, to have to go to the supermarket and not really know what's in any of the foods other than the apple is very, very scary. Um, the progression, as you've asked about, as having kind of gone through OIT and gotten past it, is that now we're not in that position anymore. And, you know, I've said it already, but I think that the, the greatest fear for parents is to have to send their children out into the world. I think you somewhat think, although it's not true, that you can protect them when they're under your wing. But then when they have to get out of the nest and you have a food allergy kid, 
suddenly you're really in a pickle and you don't know what they're going to touch and what they're going to eat. And you don't want them to be that kid who's sitting in the lunchroom separated from all the other kids. Um, you know, when I do lunch duty at my son's middle school, it breaks my heart to see that child sitting at the end, eating different foods from everyone else and not being able to talk to the other children. The promise of the end of food allergy is for that kid, that kid who has to be excluded during lunch. Um, what we hope for, what Kari and I hope, and, and we hope that this book will be the beginning of, of a long road towards the end, is that that child should never have to sit separately from all the other kids. Um, that mother is at home worrying that the kid remembered to pull out his own lunch and not take, not be tempted by what the other kids are eating. And so that's the great hope here. And science has changed so fast before my very eyes. I know Kari's a scientist, so she's used to it. But for me to have seen the, 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 the difference from when we started 10, 12 years ago and today, and what organizations like FAIR are doing in this space to progress the end for, for all people all over the world is incredible. Um, and so thank you, FAIR. Um, thank you, Kari Nadeau, and all of your colleagues all over the world, because for us as families, um, you are our heroes, and we are grateful. Yeah, the patients and the families are the heroes. You guys work so hard. It's a team effort for sure. <sighs> Absolutely. Um, Dr. Nadeau, as a physician talking really personally, how do you think people with food allergies are perceived in the world? And how is the work that you're doing helping to change that? I feel that food allergies are something that people really need to understand more about. In the past 20 years since I started to be in this field, I've seen perceptions change but I still think there are people out there that don't quite understand the disabling features that a food allergy family has to go through in life. And Sloan touched upon some of these, whether or not you're on immunotherapy or not, that we as a society need to be compassionate towards all people. But importantly, for people with food allergies, it's not just the person that has the food allergies affected, it's the family members, it's the coach, it's the teachers, it's people that need to put on the shoes of that child or that adult that has been living in fear of eating something that could be life-threatening. And that needs to be taken seriously. People need to be able to know how to use injectable epinephrine devices and use them quickly and understand that this is not something that someone's complaining about. This is a real disease that needs to be treated and to be taken care of carefully. And that being said, we want to make sure that people understand the disease. And that's one of the reasons why we have the book, that to diagnose it well, take care of people, having people's mindsets be different when they go through therapy, to make sure that they hold on to the team, to help them adjust as they go through therapy, and make sure they know that we're here to help them. But I also want to take pause in that when I think about what it's like for someone with food allergy, the one thing that I've learned going through COVID, and we've all gone through COVID, is that in the shelter in place, in some of the rules and regulations that were absolutely necessary to prevent the spread of this disease, it's very similar to what food allergy patients have had to go through themselves and what families went through. Food allergy patients were always worried about getting exposed on an airplane. They were always worried about getting touched and possibly having a reaction. They always had to be very smart about going out to restaurants, as you heard from Sloan, or going out to uh, a food um, store, making sure that they know what to touch and what not to touch. In addition, food allergy patients need to worry about labels, and I'm glad that the labeling laws have been changed thanks to FAIR. But in that same notion of compassion, and that same notion of putting yourself in the shoes of another person, I feel like COVID has taught us in a way what it's like to live with food allergy. To be able to worry all the time about being exposed is what we're doing now in the time of COVID. And that's something that is typical for a patient and a family with food allergy. I think you put that so beautifully, um, Dr. Naidu, that, you know, COVID has been really challenging for everyone, but if we were to look for a silver lining, perhaps it's that piece of compassion. 
So you um, titled this book, The End of Food Allergy. And do you think that we're in a juncture in time where we're truly seeing what you share in this book being the first domino to fall in absolutely eliminating this epidemic? It's a great question. I think like anything, you've named it really well. It might be the first domino to fall. In many things, we're looking for that to be able to end disease. And I'm very careful to not say the word cure because to me, cure means we have to make sure that person is protected and doesn't have food allergy until they're 100 years old. However, I think to many people and to people that have been through this, and like Sloan said, it's not always easy. And we need to get better and better and better at making sure we cure everyone. But in that, I do believe that for many people, the end is in sight, that there is an FDA approved drug, that there are breakthrough therapies going through, even in phase three right now, that are funded by many different companies. There are so many companies in the space now the FDA, the EMEA in Europe is looking forward to being able to see new therapeutic regimens that work. So yes, I think the end of food allergy is in sight and we need to make sure that that's a possible vision for everyone. And there are many people working in this space and I'm really excited to be part of that as part of the team of researchers to do this work. Fantastic. It's actually really nice to hear that there is such a collaborative approach across the world as well, uh, that everybody is really sharing their learnings. Sloan, for people who are participating in this session and they really want to find out more, where do we go from here and what can people do? Um, for starters, I just would like to say that uh, the first domino falling is such a wonderful analogy. I'm just hoping you don't mind that you haven't, you know, um, uh, you don't mind if we use that going forward. And I, I, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful way to look at it. Um, but for more information, thank you for asking. Um, we've set up a website, theendoffoodallergy.com. We are hoping to make it more robust with every day. We're hoping to have more resources on it and really engage the community so that everybody can, um, as you say, this, this is a group uh, group effort here, and, and there's enormous collaboration amongst the scientists, the hospitals, the doctors, the nonprofits, the biggest NGO in the world, FAIR, and, um, and that, that's really exciting. And so we hope that the website will be a hub for some of that information, and um, uh, obviously to be in touch with the, big the closest big hospital in your community, as well as doctors, this is the first domino. Thank you. Um, and so our dream, I think Kari would agree, is that this be available to everyone all over the world. We've been so excited about um, worldwide interest in the book. That's a new thing for me. And I know that made Kari so happy to know that we could sell the book in, in countries all over the world because it meant to her that people were really interested in this topic and interested in disseminating, disseminating the right information all over the world. And so for us, that was a really great thing um, and very exciting. And, um, and we just want to spread the good word. Um, and so we're so delighted to be here and that you would have us. And thank you for the first domino. I hope you won't mind if I use it going forward. Not at all. Thank you so much for the wonderful work that both of you have done. As I said, one of the things that I absolutely love about this book is that whether you're dealing with food, food allergies or you're wanting to prevent it, there is something here for everyone and it does provide the community with a lot of hope. So thank you, Dr. Karin Naidu. Thank you, Sloan Bennett. Thank you. And thank you for sharing the stories of uh, your children, especially Violet, with us today as well. So grateful. Thanks so much. Thank you, Fair.